Our gospel reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. And it reads, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She said she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but very few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will now, it will, and it will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I come to you today with a sermon that asks the question, what's got your attention? We are living in a world that is full of distractions. Distractions that have one sole purpose in life, and that is to grab your attention and come between whatever it is that you have to do whether it's something important for yourself or whether it's something that you're doing for God. To start this sermon on a positive note, as I always do, sometimes distractions can be a good thing, particularly when you find yourself engaged in tasks that are tedious or boring. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then a distraction will come along and just sort of break up the monotony and give you that renewed energy to go back and to complete whatever it is that you're working on, giving you a moment to just simply catch your breath so that you won't feel like you're being beaten up by all the challenges in the world. And then there are the typical distractions that we all experience. These are the distractions that come into our lives to grab our attention and cause us to focus on things that are not important, to pull us away from the things that we know we need to attend to. These distractions, as we all know, come in many forms. They may come in the form of something that we may see or hear or experience, like those breaking news articles that flash up on your phone or on your television or your radio. You're working hard, cleaning, building, fixing, and all of a sudden, flash, breaking news. And then before you know it, three hours later, you're still sitting in front of the TV or sitting there listening to the radio. Or one of my favorite distractions, the unexpected knock on the door. And before you know it, you've got company for the next few hours. And when this happens, now comes the big challenge. How do we get refocused? How do we get back to what it is that we need to do? Well, once we identify and acknowledge the distraction that's trying to grab your attention and take you away from what it is that you were trying to do, now comes the challenge of trying to address it so that you can get back to what it is that you have to do. Sometimes it may mean intentionally shutting out the world, turning off that radio, turning off the TV, putting that phone away so that you don't hear it buzz or ding. While other times it may mean walking away from someone or something that has found a way to distract you from what it is that you have to do. Now, for the most part, generally speaking, these things work. But the reason why I say generally speaking is because, of course, nothing is perfect, 
And there are times when the distractions are too big and too loud and grab too much of your time, energy, and attention that you can't get away from them. But nevertheless, there's still ways for us to get refocused. Because here's the other part. We talk about distractions that happen from the outside, the TV, the radio, and people knocking on our doors. But what happens? What happens when that distraction comes from within your own self, when your own thoughts, your own ideas, are the things that are taking you away from the things that you need to do? What happens when the distractions are your very own thoughts? Hold on to that question as we take a look at two stories that are fairly familiar to many of us, two instances of distractions that had the potential of stopping God's work from moving forward. The first one was read by our own Dottie. In the Old Testament, where we find Moses sitting with his father-in-law, Jethro, having a wonderful conversation, Moses told him about all of the amazing things that God has done for the people of Israel through him, how he has blessed them and protected them and guided them out of Egypt to safety. And as they finished this conversation, Moses then took his usual seat to impart upon the people of Israel the wisdom of God that he had for them. When Jethro saw this, he said to Moses, what you're doing is not good. He says, what you're doing is going to render you useless because you're going to wear yourself out. And once you do that, once you wear yourself out, once you become frustrated and tired and inundated with hearing problem after problem from sun up to sundown, you will not be any good for the people and the people will not be blessed by the work that you're trying to do. And so here's where the distraction part comes into this story. In the case of Moses, the distraction that he was struggling with was one that was self-induced. As you look through the scripture, nowhere did God tell Moses to sit down and be the judge and the voice of wisdom and to settle disputes between the people of Israel. He took that upon himself because he was the one leading them and guiding them and representing God in their presence. But he decided in and of himself that this is something that he wanted to do, not realizing that as soon as he sat down and said, okay, the complaints and solving problem session is now open, he didn't realize that everybody in Israel would come to him with a problem and an issue. And as we dig into some of the historical data, you'll find out that the problems that they were coming to him with were not things about God or about their life or about how and where they're going. They were disputes about things like, my cousin took my, my cereal or, or my mother didn't let me sleep late tonight and I want you to let her know. You know little itty bitty insignificant things that he sat with all day long. Distractions that had to be dealt with. Thankfully, as he spoke with Jethro, Jethro was able to get his message through, to tell him that all of these things that you're doing for the people, you may think that you're doing it for all the right reasons, but depending upon how you look at it, from the outside looking in, some of us may say, you know what? He did it because he was God's chosen one and he had a little arrogance thing going on. So he felt that he was the only one who could answer the problems and questions and issues and concerns of the people of Israel. Or if you look at it from another perspective, you can say that he did this. He didn't want to close his door, or step away from the people because he loved and cared so much about them that he wanted to make sure that everything was okay with them. 
so that they would have no issues, no problems, no worries, no concerns, so they can go off and live their life as they journeyed off to where God was leading them. But regardless of how you look at this from the perspective of arrogance or the perspective of loving and caring, the bottom line is all of that took all his time and his energy and efforts away from the people and the work that God had called him to do. God called him to lead the people of Israel to the promised land. And so by listening to Jethro and distributing those responsibilities and training others to do the work, he was then able to refocus his attention back on God and to continue to lead the people to their destination in the promised land. Beloved, distractions creep up in many forms, even when we don't realize they're there. Our second example of someone being distracted takes place in our gospel reading. Here we find two sisters, Mary and Martha, preparing their house to receive who probably would have been listed as one of the most important guests they would ever have stepped foot in their door. And like anyone else, when you have important dignitaries come into your house, you want everything to be perfect. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that when Pastor Anna was going to somebody's house, people have gone as far as to cook these amazing meals, clean and redecorated the house, hired cleaning services to come in and do all this stuff so that when she walked in the front door, you would say, welcome in and be impressed, or she would be impressed. But here's the thing. Just like Jesus, Pastor Anna doesn't really care what's going on in there when she's coming to just see you. Jesus was there to see them. And though they wanted to prepare the house for Jesus, his arrival, after they finished all their decorating, they realized that no matter how much they did, there was still more that needed to be done. And they just simply ran out of time. As they ran out of time and Jesus arrived, Mary said, I'm done. I'm here to spend time with Jesus. And so Mary sat at his feet and began to listen to whatever it was that Jesus had to share. Martha, on the other hand, was so intent on finishing the work or preparing for the arrival of their guests that she ultimately neglected her guest. Beloved, Mary's distraction was Jesus walking in, and that was a good one because she put her priorities in the right place and Jesus was her, had her attention. Martha, on the other hand, was still intent on preparing for her guests. But the challenge is you can prepare for your guests and when they arrive, you can still ignore your guests and not have time to spend with your guests because you're spending all of your time being distracted by making everything perfect. Beloved, these are the types of things that have the ability to grab our attentions and to distract us from what's important. Taking a look at the world we're living in today, we are filled with tons and tons of distractions that are meant to do one thing and one thing only. And that is to take our attention away from the most important thing in the world. And that is 
take our attentions away from God and from serving God. We've all been taught the commandment that tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we have been taught that we are to love our neighbors the way that we love ourselves. But here's how the distractions work. The distractions creep in and create a filter, create distractions that will take our attentions away from what is intended in these commandments and tells us, well, you can love your neighbor, but, and then the distraction is, well, who is your neighbor? The distraction is, well, what if you don't like your neighbor? The distraction is, what about those people, whoever those people are? Those are the distractions that come to us through the media, social media, and all the popular conversations that are taking place in the world. But if we step away from all those distractions, what you'll find when you look in the Bible is the one thing that the world will not admit is not there. And that is, when Jesus gave those commandments, there were no caveats. There were no add-ons. There were no exceptions to the rule. It said, love your neighbor as you love yourself, period. There were no unless or except or maybe if or what if or possibility of. None of that was there. And no matter what translation of the Bible you find, including when I looked it up in Greek, the original writing of this particular one, it has no caveats. We add that in as our distractions of how the world tells us to filter things out. We allow these distractions, again, of the news, the media, social media, and popular culture to tell us how to interpret the Word of God. But whatever happened with Jesus telling us how to read the Word of God and how to live the Word of God? Beloved, this is where we have to identify those distractions and to put them in their proper place, to push them away and deal with them accordingly. Beloved, people of God, do not allow the distractions of this world to grab your attention and take you away from the way that God wants us to live in, to understand and abide by those two commandments that God has given us. We're going to hear and see a lot of things on this life's journey that's going to try to convince us that there are exceptions to God's rules. Beloved, don't let those distract you. We're going to come across things in this world that's going to try to convince you that, well, maybe there were some misinterpretations of how Jesus meant those commandments. Don't let those distract you. But if by chance you find yourself in a place where you have been distracted just a little bit, I invite you to do two things. The first one is to just pause for a moment and just ask God to help you to refocus your attention on him and block out all of the distractions. And then the second thing, Take out your little Bibles, your phone, however you get to your scripture, and read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 31. And it reads, and I quote, Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. And then let that sit for a minute. And then when you go out into the world, when you turn on your radios, your televisions, you go out on social media, and you hear all these other things trying to distract you, remember those things. Remember that scripture. Remember how God wants us to treat one another. And slowly but surely, you'll begin to remove those distractions, and you'll actually get to see what God truly wants you to see. And so, beloved, I challenge you 
to live your life without distractions. Let the only thing that grabs your attention is God and God alone. Amen? Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you so much for the reminder that we are yours and there are no exceptions to the rules. And so, Lord, we thank you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.